Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have back with us Nina Acosta, who's the founder and CEO of Transcend the Light, a transformational life coach. And today we will be talking about emotional trigger management. Nina, welcome back to the program. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. You're welcome, and I guess we should start with, uh, first of all, what is an emotional trigger? Because to manage something, we need to know what it is. So get us started off with that. What is an emotional trigger? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, an emotional trigger is basically, it can sometimes be physical too, a physical or emotional response to an external factor. And sometimes that response reminds an individual of a traumatic event or ne- negative experience in their life. So um, a lot of times if you are, quote unquote, triggered, you may feel like you're being blamed for something or some insecurities, you know, might pop up like you're being excluded or criticized, which is your internal, your internal clock saying, okay, I am triggered and um, you're actually being triggered by that external factor instead of the, you know, instead of actually realizing what's actually going on in that situation. Yeah, like it might be misinterpreted. You might lash out at something and think, oh, well, that was the cause of it. But in reality, if you dig in deeper, it's because it was something from the past that connected up in your mind like a an anchor kind of a thing. Correct. Yeah. So just a lot of times, you know, I see it a lot of times in my clients in relationships. So they may, they have, they may have a new relationship, right? And they may have had a traumatic experience um, with their old partner. And so they sometimes bring that into that environment and then they have to realize that they're actually being triggered that that situation isn't actually happening as they perceive it. Um, and it's a lot of times their brain playing tricks on them. Yes. Um, and so I guess the question then is when you have a circumstance like what we were talking about um, before is you, you're aware, you notice that, ooh, something's just not what, right. So I want to be aware of this. Um, how in the world do you figure it out what the source is? Because I would suspect that you have a lot of people that ask you, I'm, you know, this triggered me. Yeah, I get it. I check the box and say I'm triggered, but who knows where it came from? That's got to be like a puzzle. Yeah, it can be sometimes, um, and it's always important to, you know, obviously talk to a friend or seek professional help or get a coach so they can help you identify that. Um, in the moment, what I usually tell people um, is to, because they have the awareness there, they are triggered, and especially if it's an intense emotional response like anger, um, I usually tell them to implement a pattern interrupt, and that usually, yeah. you know, shifts their mind really quick, gets their emotions in check, it brings that awareness to them. And that way they can go and actually figure out where it came from. Um, some things that some people do are breath work. Breath work usually resets the nervous system. It's a great fast way to get our bodies in check right away, right? It doesn't have to be like a super integra- integrated process. You just breathe three yeah. times, you know, and hold the breath and then release. Or just walk away, even. That's a good, you know, pattern interrupt as well, is just tell that person, obviously, communicate, you know, and say, hey, I need a second to go for a walk, you know, and then... Anything outside of the normal. Right. Correct. Because, like, a pattern interrupt could be, I wear a rubber band, I'm going to snap my wrist, and that's a pattern interrupt. Or it could be, like you said, like, the breathing. So I think that you... um, I've said this so many times in in uh, various circumstances, but does this apply here? If we um, pack our lives so tight full of stuff and we're just going busy, busy, going crazy, sometimes we don't give ourselves the time to notice, you know, oh, I'm upset about this or I'm ang- anxious about this or I'm being triggered, but you're not even um, allowing yourself to notice that because you're just off to the next thing, off to the next thing. And you're like, yeah, I'll do deal with that later. So you don't even get to the chance of let's do a pattern interrupt and let's because we're packing our lives so busy. 
Correct, correct. And what I always tell people is to implement like some type of anchor for transitioning too as well, right? When you're transitioning from your home in the morning to going to work or from work coming back home, to implement something that is going to be an anchor for them, it can be anything, you know, it can be something really simple that gets their brain to know that they are transitioning into like another role, right? Um, Because you're going to let, you want to let go of everything that you're holding on to because you're right. Because if you don't transition, If you don't slow down and be present, you're going to bring whatever it is that's affecting you from a situation that happened 15 minutes ago. It could affect what happened six hours ago, you know, when you're back home with your family. And you may not even realize it in that moment unless you slow down and be like, okay, where are these feelings coming from, right? Am I really being rejected by my partner? Yeah. Uh, so, so that's a good example. Let's talk about some examples of emotional triggers. What would that look like, sound like, feel like? Um, and then we're gonna we're gonna want to you know some examples without you know scenarios or whatever. But what are some things that people could be going? Ooh, you know, I ne- probably never would have thought of that as a trigger, but yep, it sure is. Yeah, that's a great question. So one thing that comes up often um, is abandonment in my clients, right? Um, so it can be something as simple as somebody not getting back to them right away, you know, through a text message, they may be like, you know, oh my gosh, you know, what's going on? They're not liking me anymore. You know, that type of thing. And the person on the other end is just busy and they have a a lot of stuff going on. Right. And they're not even thinking about that, but it's affecting that person. They're like, oh my gosh, you know, they're questioning their friendship. Are we even friends anymore? Or the fact that, you know, if they invite somebody to go somewhere and the person for some reason has to cancel, they may have a sense of rejection, you know, um, thinking that that person rejected them and all that, you know, but usually the person is just busy. They have, you know, because we yeah. all have our own lives, right? Um, so those are some things that I see that come up a lot um, in my clients, the abandonment and rejection, or they think someone's criticizing them. Like we all know at work, yeah. sometimes we get these emails, right? <laughs> and well, sometimes we are reading in between the lines. Sometimes there right. is something to read, but sometimes there is not anything. Most of the time there's not. Yeah. Yes. Right. And we're reading it in our own tone right? because of how we feel in that state, in that moment. And so we're putting our own connotation to what the email says instead of. And, and if you were it. to approach that person, let's say in the hallway and you're like, hey, why were you so snipping that email? They'd be like, what? And and so right. I, I think I, so let's let's uh, think about something in some of these scenarios, like you mentioned, like, oh, this person had to cancel. And now you might feel abandoned because, right, you you know, you, you had something in your past that would would uh, have caused that uh, be, to be connected. And then there's the trigger. So you could be say, well, you uh, need to stop feeling that way when that's a broad statement. I know that's harsh, but right. there could be that. Per- <laughs> so we're, we're, I'm not saying this is what you would say, but there's two sides of the equation. That person could say to the other person, you know, when you, um, you're my best friend and I want you to know this moving forward, when you had to cancel, it made me feel like this. And so, hey, the next time something like that comes up, could you just please say it this way or do this? that might be unnecessary because that's putting a lot on the other person. And now this other person has to go, oh, my word, I was going to go see a movie with this person next week, and now I've got to do this whole lead-in with, oh, you're amazing, but I just feel like – so where is the balance? I think – I guess that's my point. My question is where is the balance because there should be some give and take on both sides of the equation because if someone told me, oh, hey, when you do this, it makes me feel this way, it would be like, oh, I have no clue, and it might be just an easy thing for me to do, but if it requires me to be – you know, doing nine paragraphs of of an introduction conversation or text and then finally go, oh, and I need to reschedule because that's just a lot to put on that other person, isn't it? No, no, I agree. But you also got to look at it like you got to think about how much you value that friendship, right? Mm -hmm. So like if it's something with my best friend and she says, hey, you triggered me when you said this because I can be very direct sometimes. And I'm like, oh, okay, of course, you know, because I love her. She's been my best friend forever. And I want to, you know. I had no clue. We have. Yeah, yeah, a fulfilling, loving, healthy friendship, right? Yes. But um, yeah, and it all depends because if it's a stranger, right? <laughs> that can be yeah. kind of catch you off guard, and you might be like, "Oh, whoa, I don't know how I want to." So, so friend. you might say, "Okay, note to self, you know, as uh, Nina's telling me as my coach, when so, when you feel the little bit triggered." First, before approaching that person, um, if you want to ask them to do something differently in the future, 
assess the level of friendship. Like if it's someone you just met and it's like, well, BT dubs, uh, the next time you, then it's like, what? I, 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 we just met and, but then if, what if it is a very good or best friend, now you could easily say to them, Hey, look, you know, you know how I've told you in the past that I experienced blah, blah, blah. Um, when you said this way, it kind of, I know I probably took it to, to, uh, 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 was a little sensitive, but if you could just, and I think that the level of the, connection in the relationship really is the answer to that question. Yes. And two, also like the level of the connection to in a relationship, but like if it's a complete stranger, you know, um, and you don't have to give like a long response like that either, you know, yeah. <laughs> like if it's like a, if it's a good friend, you're just like, Hey, you know, I'm just working through some triggers right now. Right. Like, yep. and that's how I felt. Um, but also too, if it's a complete stranger, what I would just do is that's where our boundaries come in. Right. So that's where boundaries for yourself, yeah. the type of relationships that you want to build with people. So it's kind of like, OK, everybody has their own set of boundaries on or they should it's healthy boundaries. Right. Yeah. Um, a lot of times people don't, but they should have healthy boundaries on what they will and will not accept. And if that per- that thing or that situation is outside your boundaries, even though you are triggered, then maybe, you know, you can lovingly, energetically space yourself out from that person, you know, yeah. Um and so you don't have to have that conversation. It's kind of like, yep. okay, this happened more than once. It's happened three times. You know, I am going to energetically space myself out. Or, or if it happened three times before you do that, just make sure that it is something that is triggering you internally. Yeah, because you would know, okay, well, this this is the you know a newer friendship slash relationship, and this is irking me about whatever. And so maybe you're going to go, okay, I'm just going to put a little – it doesn't mean I hate that person. It just means I'm going to put a little space there. I'm not going to invite them over you know, seven days a week uh, in a row, but I'm going to put a little space there. And then if that thing trigger still um, kept firing – for whatever reason, if you saw the potential that for that relationship, friendship or relationship to move ahead, maybe then you go, hey, just, you know, a little FYI. And I think that that's interesting is sometimes people feel guilty that they have to put some space in into a relationship, but there's nothing wrong with that. That's better than having some blow up. Right. Absolutely. Because that's one thing you want to avoid for sure. And I know like from my past is that like that blow up, right? Just go ahead and talk about how you feel if it's a relationship that you do want to salvage and you do yeah. value. So then let's say that you are having these triggers happening. How do you learn to stop being triggered by someone? So, you know, and maybe that entails having a conversation, but what, could there be some things that you can do yourself to kind of go, okay, this person is just always going to be this way. I just need to condition myself to just, you know, uh, uh, you know, com- realize that it's the way that they are. So how, how can you do that within yourself? Yeah. So if it's somebody that's in your life, I would say, you know, we all have more positive traits, you know what I'm saying? And we have more wounded. Some of us have wounded traits. And so just focus on the more positive traits that they do have, I would say, because a lot of times we always focus on the negative versus Mm -hmm. what value they bring to the relationship. And, you know, what you focus on is what you're going to see more of. And so it's going to cause you to be more triggered. One thing that I do uh, suggest to my clients, and this does work, is that if you're getting triggered by someone that's in your life, you know, consistently. And there's just like, maybe you guys co-parent together or something like that. Um, And so there's different tactics that you can do. There's one that works well. And it's like, imagine them, you know, because it's true. If you're getting triggered by somebody or if they are, you know, just say there's a confrontation and they're sending you messages or whatever that are like crazy. um, Just imagine them as like, I don't know, a Disney character or something. You know what I'm saying? Like you bring, like envision them as a Disney character. I go to Donald Duck because I just envision Donald Duck making his quacking noises. And it really does take away that intense emotion because they're not in a state of being receptive for you to speak to them, but just imagine them in that state. And it might be even maybe a small child, you know, as their smaller self. You know, um, if you imagine them in that way, too, it really takes the emotional response from the situation. And it just helps you to see it in a different light. Correct. Yes. 
I've, I've heard the example before, not in triggering like we're talking about here, but like um, what if someone on the road, you know, is like borderline road rage and they're tailgating and they're blowing the horn and then we're going around you and you could feel like, oh, you know, I'm so mad about that. But what if? Hypothetically, you found out that that person had just gotten a 911 call that their spouse is in you know, the emergency room. They're just trying to get there. Now, all of a sudden, you would view that situation very differently because it's like, oh, yeah, go, go, go. So, it, you know, not that you would ever know that, but that's the feeling. It's like that scenario. In one case, you're ready to, you know, blow your own horn and tailgate them. But in the other scenario, when you know that information, it's like, oh, yes. I'm compassionate now. So how can you construct that in these situations? Cool idea about the cartoon character. Yeah. And that situation, um, road rage and being on the road, I would definitely have to turn on some music, right? Some yeah. uplifting music or some music to snap me out of it. Cause that's how I operate. So it's identifying how you operate. And especially yeah. when you're driving, there's not, you know, much that you can do. You can't jump up and down. But if you have something on your wrist or you can change the radio station to something like, you know, the 80s or whatever that gets you going in that high vibe state, that does help. Or even, you yep. know, if you like Christian music, put on Christian music, you know, like that will you know, help and, re and remind you. Exactly. Um, I used to do uh, this when it came uh, every month to pay the bills, and you just have uh -huh. that gut wrenching feeling. You're like, oh, yeah. just I would put on '80s music and go, okay, at least I can feel good while I'm doing something that I don't like. So it, it really, it, it's a fact. It is not some woo woo weirdy thing. It's like, yeah. just, what do you? Why not? You know, like, um, you know, the the runner's high. Well, maybe if you know that you've got a stressful afternoon coming up, go take a quick run and get cleaned up. And now you can handle the the. Day. So I mean, it's it's you need to know you and someone like when we mentioned, you know, eighties music. Someone might be irked with that. Like, oh, well, I prefer country. Okay, cool. Then put that on. Um, or you know, I don't like Donald Duck. Well, then how about Goofy? And and maybe Goofy right. is the great character because he's just a big goofball and he just is happy go lucky. So. It re that's a really interesting um, uh, 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 admonition. Um, I've even heard of, I think it was, I, I attribute it to Tony Robbins years ago. I heard a, a teaching that he did where he was like, if you have this memory that, oh, just, you can't, it's just really bugging you, replay it in your mind, but put some, you know, like circus music, like clown music in your, you know, and then, and then in your mind, just kind of scratch it out. And, and so now you're replaying it, but yet it's got a, a fun vibe to it. And, and if you don't like clowns, then obviously you would use something different, but you've got to re-anchor that feeling, that trigger, that event with something that you're perceiving is good. Right. Correct. Something that's going to um, change the way you're feeling instantly. And, you know, even, I have at one point in time, I remember way back, I had a boss that was really triggering before I was doing all this work, but I didn't even realize what I was doing. I started singing um, the Frozen song, like, let it go, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, every yeah. time I was around this person, I would get so, like, bit out of shape. And yep. I was like, you know what, I'm not going to do this anymore. And so I would just play music before I even realized what I was doing. And I would sing that, you know, and then, you know, my staff, they would laugh at me because I would sing, but it was just like, it was uplifting it was getting me out yep. of that state and that was your coping mechanism much. right okay so that's a good point um it's one thing to have a brand new friend or a stranger and do you confront them well we talked about that how about your bestie okay we talked about that what if it's a coworker and even worse a boss how in the world do you go approach a boss and go uh you're triggering me yeah so <laughs> they just leave the doors so you got to be really careful <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. And some people have to be careful. You do have to be careful what you say and how you say it, you know, and hopefully you guys have established some type of relationship, right? Yeah. You know, so you can confront them if that's what you're going to do. But it's having just an open conversation. It doesn't have to be, you know, so on a deep level that, hey, you know, you're triggering me because of my dad issues or, you know what I'm saying? At work. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that transparent, but you can come across and say it in a way that's professional yeah. and most bosses are receptive, but I wouldn't suggest, you know, if it's in heated discussion, yeah. I wouldn't suggest bringing it up there. You know, I would suggest and wait where everything comes down and then call a meeting or a lunch or a coffee, whatever resonates you know, um, in that environment and have a discussion with them yeah. and put it out there. But it's also going back to yourself, you know, because it's not pointing the finger at somebody else and blaming somebody else for your trigger. Right. 
It's yep. just bringing an awareness to it and maybe giving some clarity why you reacted the way you reacted. And, and but as long as it's not in the heat of the moment and in some type of a back and forth argument, that boss right. um, should and could go, oh, wow, thank you so much. for. And then maybe that opens up a different level of a relationship to go, hey, well, tell me about yourself. And let me. And so it really could be like a really open, authentic, transparent you know, breakthrough in a relationship if you're doing it the right way. And that's boss or no boss. That could be friend. So it could be something where it's like, hey, thank you so much for sharing that. That makes a, a whole lot of sense. Right. Yeah. No, you're a hundred percent right. Cause a lot of things and what I've realized in my own life and then coaching other people too, is just like a lot of these situations could have not have blown up <laughs> if there was just a conversation, right? Yeah. It didn't have to be like a deep conversation. It's like, Hey, you know, this really bugged me when you did this, you know? Um, but a lot of, we don't talk about that. We just kind of like try to push it under the rug and then it festers and it festers and it festers. And then it comes out in all areas of our life that one situation is affecting, you know, our home life and our work life. And instead of just talking about it, releasing it and just acknowledging the emotion too, you know, as an individual, yes. because a lot of times we try to suppress our feelings and don't acknowledge what we're feeling. And then it keeps arising and it keeps arising. And so if we acknowledge it, that it's there and it's okay, you know, with no judgment or shame that we are feeling that, then we can release that emotion as well. So let's say that you start learning how to do this within yourself and you start making some progress and it's never flipping the switch and I'm cured and fine and never going to happen again. We know that it's going to be ebbs and flows. Um, what if you start noticing that in a friend and you start, you know, because sometimes you, you can't see the forest for the trees. So the friend is like getting triggered and upset and frustrated with whatever the situation is and they they aren't able to see it, but you can't. How do you help a friend that is being triggered by a situation scenario or someone else? Well, I would, one, acknowledge their situation and what they're going through. You know, don't say they're over-exaggerating or anything like that. Yeah. Like, be a listening ear and acknowledge what they're going through. Um, and just make sure you provide that safe space that where they can come to you and talk to you about it, right, with no judgment. And usually, and that if you're noticing it, you know, maybe give them a new perspective on how to look at the situation, you know, maybe give them a new a new positive perspective on how to look at the situation instead of having them being stuck um, in their own, you know, mental anguish about being triggered about the same thing. So that's what I would do. Yeah, that's a great point. And when they can see that you're coming at it from a perspective of, oh, you know what? You know, like I remember this, um, uh, one of these like human resources trainer speakers years ago had said, you know, if you're like at the hotel and you work the front desk and um, there's a angry guest and you don't call up to the boss and say, come down here, we've got a problem. Um, you call up and say, come down here, we have an opportunity. Well, the opportunity is right. to solve a problem in the right way, make a friend for life, make it, you know, whatever. So in this situation, like with a friend or any of these, it's not necessarily a problem that needs to be solved. It's an opportunity to work through this, you know, issue trigger so that you can uh, alleviate it somewhat or, or as much as possible and um, bolster that relationship. Right. And so, and that's a great thing that you brought that up because, you know, everything is an opportunity, right? And it's just like yeah. basically how you view the world because there's some people that view the world that want to see everything negative and there's the people that view the world that look for opportunities. And so that would be a great way to help them is to really work through their trigger is look at it as an opportunity. But also, um, you know, maybe tell them something that, you know, you do to work through your trigger. Yeah. Maybe share that or share what triggers you and how you work through it. Share your story. And that might help them work through theirs as well. Because no matter how hard you try, your tone could be misinterpreted, even if you're trying to be the best. And maybe they could be like, oh, well, you're talking down to me, and now you think that I'm – but if you were to integrate into that conversation, let me tell you something. I used to have, and, and I haven't conquered it, but I'm working on it, and here's the way that I've gone through it and been there, done that, and had, got the T-shirt. You know, I, My situation was this, and you know, it just reminded me of – what I noticed there with you, and I was just wondering, would would you be open to me providing some feedback that way? Because I know some things that I use might help you out. And and then you're um, positioning yourself on their same level and not, let me tell you, you, you measly person that, you know, you've got such problems, I can help you fix it. It's like, come on, let me wrap my arms around you, and, and we can work through this together. That's a really good point. Right. Mm-hmm. 
because no matter what, we can have the best intentions, but somehow, some way, a voice inflection, a raised eyebrow, a whatever, a non-capitalized letter in the text, a capitalized word in the text, you know, who knows what all, you know, uh, oh, the text came through 10 minutes later, 10 minutes sooner. All of those things can be interpreted or misinterpreted. So that's really huge. So, yeah, these these triggers kind of re- relate back to some of the things we've talked about in the past, which is being aware, noticing, you know, if you if you notice something about yourself you don't like, it could be, you know, because of a trigger, what's causing that. So let's go back to that source. So all of those things and then and and and, and could it be a positive? So how about this? Let's flip it all the way around. What's some examples of positive triggers? So if you're like, hey, every time this happens, you know, or, you know, like we're talking about with the music, can you use positive triggers to then change that state? And I know that we can, but is there a positive side to the word trigger or is it always a negative? Um, well, I tend to use like for positive aspects, like when something positive happens or for example, um, I remember when I was in sales, if I, you know, got a client, then I would basically anchor that in, you know, that feeling in yeah. um, with so, like with a smell or I would go, you know, celebrate. So, yes, there are. I yeah. don't really call them triggers, but there are. It's a, kind of like the same thing in a positive like an way. Like anchor. You're anchoring that emotion. Yeah. You're anchoring that feeling in on what it feels like. So you can use that same thing to get you back to that state because – that's a whole another conversation, you know, like being in that state when you're going to like manifest and create what you actually want out of your life is being in that high vibrational state. So anchors are great for that. Um, music is also an anchor, you know, um, moving your body and dancing and smells and champagne, whatever. But it has to be authentic to you and what resonates yeah. with you as an individual for you to anchor that state of being so you can actually when on cue get back to that state when you need to. So maybe th- this is just my impression and it might be off base, but maybe think of trigger as temporary. Like it, you know, if you pull a gun trigger, it's a, it's a quick little click and, and, and there it is. So maybe that's temporary. Anchor is more heavy, permanent. So let's anchor in the good and let's use triggers as something that's temporary and, and how we can reposition that. So, um, you know, that way we can move past it and see what's triggering and hopefully can, uh, um, you know, view that as a, as a temporary situation that you're working through. So yeah, triggers versus anchors. That's a really great, uh, juxtaposition. Yeah. Yeah. And I like your analogy too, as well, that I feel like that, um, trigger is definitely something that you can work through. Um, you know, obviously there's some like little triggers that you can eliminate quickly, but then there's some that are on a deeper level. That's what should take some time. And then they come up on different levels as you grow and evolve. It somehow yeah. circles back and you're like, Whoa, you know, <laughs> like didn't know that was still there. Bottom line is we never arrive. You know, I mean, no matter what, it, if you think, talk about spiritual, financial, you know, business-wise, you never, ever arrive. You should always be striving to, you know, incrementally improve and polish here and, and all of that. And it's just this whole process. So, yay, I fixed this one trigger, which was whatever. Um, well, well, now uh, let's move on to the next thing. And that one other trigger might creep back. So keep keep aware. So I think some of these things sound great to listen to, but someone might be uh, um, going, hey, Nina, um, I need a little bit of outside guidance because I know that I'm getting triggered, but I have no clue where the source is. How can people reach out and connect with you and maybe learn a little bit more about what you offer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, They can visit my website. I do have my calendar on there, and it's www.transcendthelight.com. And um, just click on book a call, and my calendar will pop up. It will go straight to me, and I'll be more than happy to hop on a call with them. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It was a real pleasure talking with you again, and I appreciate your time, Nina. All right. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.